Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome. My name is Clyret Mwandingi. And then and myself here I'm joined by Madame Penny Chiwikwa. To Chavi. Madame Penny to Chavi. And we'll be the director of the ceremony for tonight. Again, welcome. But before we get into the details of uh, today and the business of today, we would like to start with the first thing, which is the party, the party anthem. Thank you very much. the Swapo Youth League Commerce Region Secretary, and also a councillor of the local authority and the chairperson of the management council of the city of Induk. Please welcome Comrade Sanishuna. Ceremonies, Comrade Feni Tuchavi and Comrade Claret Mandi, Comrade Sophia Nangosha Ningwa, Secretary General of the Swapo Party, 
Comrade Ephraim Nekongo, National Secretary of the Swapo Party Youth League, members of the Central Committee of the Swapo Party, members of the Central Committee of the Swapo Party Youth League, members of the Commerce Regional Executive Committee of Swapo, members of the Commerce Regional Executive Committee of Swapo Party Youth League, Comrade leaders assigned to Commerce Region, distinguished members of the panel of the inaugural health seminar, Honorable Pumbu Shimi, Minister of Finance and Public Enterprises, and Mr. Ben Nangombe, Executive Director of the Ministry of Health and Social Services, both of whom are invited here in their professional capacities. Honorable Councillors here present, rank and file of the Sopo Party, Youth League in Commerce Region, Distinguished and invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to welcome you all this evening to this Sopo Party Youth League Commerce Region Inaugural Health Seminar. This health seminar is the first of its kind and is also the first of a series of health seminars that the Swapo Party Youth League Commerce Region will be hosting this year. Earlier this year, the Swapo Party Youth League Commerce Regional Executive Committee established a health caucus to educate and create awareness amongst Swapo Party Youth League Commerce Region on emerging health issues in Namibia, in Namibia's health sector. The health caucus aims to prioritize health amongst the political leadership of Namibia by creating a platform for the young lions of the Swapo Party Youth League in Commerce Region to discuss a host of emerging health issues. As well as challenges faced by the Namibian health sector with a view to ad of advocating for social, for solutions to address the challenges in our health sector as we strive to achieve the health-related commitments in the Swapo Party Election Manifesto 2019 to 2024. Therefore, the health seminars will create an important platform for us to have these discussions they will focus on selected topics related to the field of health. And during each health seminar, a panel of industry experts on the selected topic will be invited to engage in moderated discussions on the selected topic. The idea is to create a platform for productive discussions, therefore for the health caucus to propose recommendations to SPAL Commerce Regional Executive Committee, keeping in mind the health-related commitments of the SOPO Election Manifesto. In January 2023, a wide public debate ensued over reports in the media of alleged irregularities in the proposed award of a tender. Judicated and evaluated by the Central Procurement Board of Namibia for the supply of clinical items to the Ministry of Health and Social Services. Although the Central Procurement Board of Namibia has since cancelled the award of this clinical tender, the wide public debate in Namibia revealed that there is limited understanding of the Public Procurement Act and how it is applied in Namibia to guide the procurement goods and services for government entities. Therefore, we as the Health Caucus decided to kickstart our series of health seminars with the topic procurement of medical equipment pharmaceuticals, and clinical supplies. Dear comrades and invited guests, the objectives of this inaugural health seminar are to provide a better understanding into the work of the Ministry of Health and Social Services and the Central Procurement Board. As it relates to the procurement of medical and clinical items. To appreciate the achievements and challenges related to the public procurement process, to explore possible solutions to address the challenges related to the public procurement process so that we can improve healthcare. Now that I have set the scene, I have the pleasure of yielding the floor back to the Masters of Ceremony, and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you. Please, another heavy, heavy round of applause. Thank you very much, Comrade Sam Chadishuna Shuyoma. I'm going to address you on your own full name. <laughs> now that the scene has been set, the introduction and the protocols have been observed by the Swapo Youth League 
uh, Commerce Region Secretary, I would like to welcome and introduce at the podium the Swapo Youth League National Secretary, Comrade FM Legon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Director. Or sitting. I started with that song purposely. Before I start with what I was called for. So that as young people, we must not be misled. And that song is just telling us the journey that we have traveled as a country and as a party. And it's saying along the way, it will not be easy. There will be obstacles. But it does not mean that if there are problems in our house, we must run away from our house. We must remain in our house. That's basically what that song reminded us, that Nuyoma is our commander. He have told us that the journey is continuing to be long, especially for the economic emancipation. Director of Ceremony, I think I'm given a simple task here. And, but first of all, let me uh, abide myself to the protocol established. Because I know if I go into it, I will not finish due to time. I'm called here to introduce the keynote speaker who is going to speak today. Um, first of all, Allow me to greet you from the national headquarters. The person I'm going to introduce you firstly is a seasoned political commissar, a war veteran, a former councillor here in Windu, Windu West. Now, she is the only person that I also know that she has served two regions as a governor. One here in Commerce and on Sati region. <laughs> she has also served as a, a cabinet minister, especially minister that I can remember responsible for land that we are always crying. Um, he is a member of parliament and he is the secretary general of our mighty Swabo party. But I want to pause here. She is also the first secretary general that have retained her position in the history of politics. The seat, the seat where she's sitting is the hottest seat. <laughs> Maybe before the president one. It's the hottest seat. You all agree with me. So, but she emerged as the first secretary general, women for that matter, to serve two terms. Maybe she will receive another term. term. <laughs> the track record of service to our people is written on all landscape of our beautiful land. And indeed, uh, this event could not be. This event could not have chosen any better keynote speaker, whose presence will inspire all of us tonight. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, 
Please all rise as we welcome Comrade Sophia Nahango Sainigwa, our Secretary General of our mighty Swamp. Sophia Shaningwa, Shaningwa, Siaya, Shaningwa, Siaya, Monami. Sophia Shaningwa, Siaya, Shaningwa, Siaya, Shaningwa, Siaya, Monami. Thank you very much. Please, my comrades, you may be seated. Comrade Ephraim Nekongo, the Secretary for Swapo Party Youth League, our National Secretary for the Youth League in our country. First of all, let me thank you very much for the very good words that you have said about me. I always said uh, I do not want people to talk too much when I'm laying in my coffin, but rather they talk while I can hear what they are saying. So thank you very much, my comrade. Comrade Ipumbu Shimi, our Minister for Finance and the Public, enterprises today here in your capacity in your professional knowledge comrade uh, ed comrade nangombe ed of our ministry of health and social services today also here in your capacity as an ed of the sector ministry being health and social services and also for the knowledge that you have acquired. Comrade members of the political bureau, I have, am seeing one here, Comrade Hofni. Oh, and Shimi. <laughs> Shimi, you are, you are very fast. <laughs> I, I recognize your presence, my comrades, members of the political bureau and central committee of our party. I should also acknowledge the presence of the members of the Central Committee. Comrade Bush, you are also one here. The youth are really coming up. Central Committee of the Swako Party, the mother body, not even the youth, but the mother body, being a young lady, youthful. Thank you. I acknowledge your presence, my comrade members of the Central Committee also of the Swapo Party Youth League, if there are some that are present. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of Tatekulu, Comrade Safishuna Semnu Yoma, <laughs> Swapo Party Youth League Secretary for Commerce Region. Thank you very much, Tatekulu, for hosting us and for preparing this uh, beautiful evening going forward. I also have seen here a very important person in his career, Comrade Inji. Thomas. Tommy, Thomas, I also acknowledge uh, your presence, uh, Comrade. And uh, Paulus also of the Swapo Party, I acknowledge your your presence, perhaps there are professors, I don't know whether there are professors here of the university, lecturers and all, you are all acknowledged, dear students, and everybody, all the comrades, a very good evening. Before I really start with my topic and speech, I would like to say thank you very much for inviting me to be with you this evening. Though I spend the whole day in the office and after the, my official duties, I went to the parliament also to participate, but I really have taken it too serious that I have also to come and be with you and share a little bit and also hear how the students are, are discussing and how they are putting their issues forward. 
I should actually also say that, uh, make no mistake, you are the owners of this beautiful land, and you are the future leaders of this beautiful land. I should indicate that uh, we were all young like you. We went through all the processes like you. We had been students like you. We sat and listened. And we also have taken it upon ourselves to say, I want to get there one day. There we are today. It has came like uh, a dream sometimes when you are seeing yourself taking center stages like the Tatekulu Nuyoma after you have listened very carefully to how they have done their things for the love of this country. And it is my call that uh, when elders are amongst you, you should not only listen to them, you should actually pave the way for yourself and emulate the good examples that they are giving to you, so that at least by tomorrow, you see yourself in the same shoe. Because the future actually doesn't belong to a specific person. It is how you set it for yourself. Having said that, let me now start with what the professionals have written in this beautiful paper. <laughs> it is a great pleasure for me to have been invited to deliver a key note address at this event of the Swapo Party Youth League Commerce Region on Health Caucus under the theme A Healthy Nation is a productive nation. A productive nation is a wealthy nation. And from the onset, I must mention that this theme was carefully selected in accordance with the Swapo Party election manifesto of 2020-2025. I am delighted to see the young people speaking and creating awareness on health issues of our country. Because if you do not have a healthy nation, you hardly can have a healthy country because it is the healthy nation that drives the economic sector of that particular country. Therefore, my comrades, the youth are the future of Namibia. Therefore, inspired to, informed, empowered youth will drive innovation and inclusive development. It is only after you are empowered, after you are skilled, after we have given it out all to you, that will be able indeed to carry this beautiful land. Or else, if not, then things will be in vain. Over the years, the Swapo Party led government has established institutions and put in place programs aimed at facilitating the development and economic empowerment of our youth. The Swapo Party-led government has been committed to ensuring that quality and reliable health care services are accessible to all Namibians across the country through the expansion and modernization of health facilities. Health systems have also been strengthened to improve accessibility, affordability, sustainability of both preemptive and curative care. Directors of Proceedings, dear comrades, I must say that this session comes at the right time 
when Namibia and the rest of the world have been fighting the socio-economic consequences of COVID-19 pandemic. This must always remind us that health is one of the most important factor, factors in our country and the world at large. Yes, it is the foundation which drives the social and economic development for all. We must guarantee that the health policies and programs are prioritized and effectively implemented. Dear Comrades, during this financial year 2023 to 2024, the Minister of Finance and Public Enterprises tabled a national budget of 84.6 billion to the parliament. Of this amount, 9.7 billion was allocated to the Ministry of Health and Social Services. And a significant amount of this will be spent on the acquisition of clinical and pharmaceutical supplies, so as medical equipment and medical devices targeting the, to strengthening in our healthcare system in terms of detection of diseases, treatment, and treatment monitoring. This is the second largest budget after education in the whole government. And here we are sitting at an education institution when we are talking about this very huge amount of budgets that are targeted in targeting our country, education and health. Therefore, it is my view that the discussion of this topic is current, relevant and forward looking. This is truly practically providing leadership towards youth participation in the economy. It is very, very important that the youth are participating in the discussions with regard to the economy of our country. Without discussing the economy of our country, we are doomed. Because you can simply not proceed with any development if your economy is in shambles. And therefore, as students, you have to keep on discussing because by the end of the day, you will be entrusted not only to carry yourselves, but to carry the country and her people. Therefore, the importance of these discussions. Directors of Proceedings, dear comrades, in 2015, His Excellency the President of the Republic of Namibia, Comrade Dr. Hage Genko, signed into a law the new Public Procurement Act, Act number 15 of 2015. This specific act provides for regula regulation of the procurement of goods, works, and services, amongst others, which includes the clinical and phar pharmaceutical supplies, so as the medical equipment and the medical devices. Similarly, this act promotes integrity, accountability, transparency, competitiveness, supply in the process of public procurement. Prudency too. Earlier this year, there has been a public outcry over the alleged unfair allocation of a multi-million dollars 
worth of tenders related, relating to medical supplies and related health products. There have been allegations of price inflations and collusions. Such practices do not only cost government excessive amounts, but also bring the government and, and ultimately the ruling party name into this repute. The party leadership, however, has engaged the sector ministers and the better is receiving attention. I should indicate that when the outcry was there, and the people have to cry on the shoulder of government, on the shoulder of the ruling party, on the shoulder of leadership. The political bureau of Swapo Party and the Central Committee have requested the two ministries to look into the matter and see to it that the matter is rectified. <laughs> Therefore, government institutions and officials assigned with procurement responsibilities must ensure that rational decisions are taken based on verified facts, prudent use of resources, value for money, and doing more with less must be the order of the day. Dear students of NAST, our country is not that poor. But what we have to take care is how to manage the resources of our country. There are poorer countries elsewhere in the world. But the living standards might be better than ours. And therefore, I call on you as leaders who will take over today or tomorrow to keep it in mind that it is very, very important to manage the resources of the country accountably. It is very, very important to forget yourself first and know that as leaders, you have millions to take care of. And you can only take care of those men and women if you are taking the resources of this country in an accountable manner. Or else, you will sit with questions that you will not be able to answer by the end of the day. And therefore, it is your responsibility and it is a high call that all of us should take the resources and the management thereof very, very seriously. And also know that while you are having lunch and dinner at your house, there are those who are eating from the dustbins that are looking upon you to sort out and to solve the problems going forward. Therefore, without being preemptive, it is from the above mentioned perspective that I think the topic of this seminar, as well as the objectives, are timely, critical, and relevant to our current and future intentions. However, it is my hope and trust that Minister of Finance and Public Enterprises 
Comrade Shimi and other panelists will address the issue related to the topic in detail so that at least we'll be able to also explain this to the next person. Directors of Proceedings, dear comrades, I therefore wish to applaud and commend the Commerce Region Swap Party Youth League leadership for taking this initiative. It's work to be done today and not tomorrow. This is leadership and truly a sense of caring for the youth. The decision to conduct the youth seminar, health seminar, is an excellent decision. The choice of topics for discussion is extremely important, especially given the relevance of the topic to advance to, for the advancement of the youth agenda and interest. Today's deliberations will present the youth with a unique opportunity to be strategic and share ideas which will help you to forge ahead. The seminar will allow cooperative discussions, sharing of ideas, and learning from one another, which will lead to the improved communication, networking, and acquisition of new knowledge. This will ultimately lead to renewed motivation and the confidence of participation. It doesn't help to shout out there to the honorable minister, rather to organize a coming together like this one and we share on the table on one and one and have informed information for all of us that is benefiting the community out there and that is also preparing us to take the future going forward. To the attendees, I hope that everyone will listen attentively to the various issues that will be brought up during the panel discussions, contribute meaningfully to the conversation and further create factual awareness to others. I urge you all to raise questions to the panelists regarding the topic at hand and to engage one another graciously during this interaction. Lastly, I would like to commend all participants for attending this event and showing keen interest in the health seminar. It is because of you that we will be able to create the needed awareness to health sector of our country. And it is because of you that the government will be able to implement the changes as required by the public and the masses of this country yourselves. With these remarks, dear comrades, honorable minister, comrade E.D., comrade Safisuna Nuyoma, dear participants, I am wishing you only good and fruitful deliberations, and I thank you very much for your kind attention, and I would like you to call me more when you have some discussions that would like to engage on Aluta Continua Ya Victoria. Please get right and give a good round of applause.
Thank you very much. You may have your seat. Wow. What can I say? The scene, the platform, the environment, the ambience, the weather, I can say, has been created and tabled by the three secretaries. Have you realized that he has three secretaries? The regional one, Thomas, Comrade Thomas Nyoma, then we have the national one at the youth level, Comrade Nekongo. Then we have the general, the Iron Lady himself. <laughs> it just means that our proceedings are very welcome and we are blessed. And again, Comrade. Meme Sophia Shaningwa, we are really humbled to be graced with your presence this evening. I think today we have to change the narrative when we say that our elders don't want to sit with us. When I listen to the logistics that the Secretary General went through today to be here with us today, he still stands here for more than 20 minutes to deliver very harmonizing words, encouraging words. Here's another round of applause, please. Another one. Thank you very much. Now we are getting into our second session of the evening. And with that, I'm going to head over to the beautiful lady next to me, Madam and Comrade Penny Uchabi. This time I said the session correct, so she doesn't keep me. So thank you to the second session. Thank you very much. Allow me to stand in front of the already established protocol. As alluded, I am Comrade Ben Chavi. And with that said, we will then dive into the second session. Uh, I would like to call upon the moderators as well as the distinguished panelists, Comrade Ipumbu Shimi, Honorable Minister of Finance and Public Enterprise, Dr. Ben Nangobe, Executive Director of the Ministry of Health and Social Services for my Amon Gavitene, Central Procurement Board of Namibia Chairperson, and our moderators, uh, Comrade Emilia Upindi and Comrade Yalo Shimi. Thank you so much. Good evening, comrades. Good evening, comrades. Okay. Allow me to. Yeah, evening, yes, okay, hi. Um, allow me to stand on the protocol that has already been established. Uh, my name is um, Yalo Shimi. Um, I am a medical doctor in the state sector and also part of the SPYL health, health, um, health caucus. Alongside me um, is the accomplished and talented comrade Emilia uh, Upindi. She's a member of the Central Committee of the SPYL and an additional member of the National Executive Committee of the um, SPYL. Um, we'll be your moderators for the evening. As we all know, the procurement of the medical equipment, pharmaceuticals and clinical supplies is one of the most critical functions in any healthcare organization. We will be exploring some of the key challenges and opportunities associated with healthcare procurement. Our speakers are experts in the field and they will be sharing their experiences and insights on a range of topics. We hope this seminar, we hope this seminar will help us brainstorm in our, on our current procurement practices and spark ideas on how to make them more effective and more efficient. Um, thank you, Comrade Dr. Yalo. Um, just to get right into the discussion, 
Uh, the government of the Republic of Cambodia has experienced uh, various challenges in terms of procurement of public services. Uh, in times receiving substandard goods or services, or being born through corruption or negligence by awarding tenders to tenders that have no capacity or lack of experience. So, and this has really affected sometimes most of uh, the, the health facilities in, uh, in terms of the uh, stock of, uh, of medicines equipment, and also there's quite a, a serious public uproar in terms of how some of these centers will, will facilitate. So uh, our, our panelists this evening are going to, 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 add, to enlighten us, unpack this topic, and then also share with us in terms of uh, the, 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 the different mandates of the different institutions, then also take us through the public uh, procurement act as well. What does it entail? What are its objectives? So, uh, like our our panelists already introduced, get right into the discussion. I'll start off by saying that the procurement of public goods and services, guided by the Public Procurement Act, uh, the Act 15 of 2015, which was entered into force in April 2016, with the aim to address the abuses in the public procurement system. So maybe to start off the discussion uh, on Roboshini, you can please enlighten us on this public, uh, public Procurement Act. What are its objectives? What are some of the challenges in its implementation? And what are some of the successes that we have seen? I'll, I'll give it to you on Roboshini. Thank you very much. Um, the participants and the audience, I think that Dr. says, um, they are to for the question to answer. I think they found me. I believe we were all, um, we are now away because the SG told us that President signed. New Public Procurement Act in law. Where is the legal issue? To manage the public procurement system. Obviously. Um, now, the objective of that law is really to ensure that when the government is procuring goods, government buys goods, with us, cars, um, buys pens, but the government also procures. Government is building a hospital, all of these are regulated. Okay. Now, the objective is that when, 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 when company is procuring, it has to do so just in a transparent manner. In other words, let's be I can't just send up today and say, I'm going to um, give this tender to my friend because this is my friend. So that's not the principle that, 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 that the public procurement act promotes. They it must be transparent and they must be because the government wants to get one for money. The government can only get one for money when they Competition. More people will come and say, I'm going to supply you this good at this price. The other one will say, at that price. And of course, company will then take what is called the most responsive bidder. Now, the most responsive bidder does not necessarily mean that the lowest price. It means the person who is going to deliver the, the good and the right quality may not be the, the lowest price, but generally you have to want to your customer whatever to the lowest price. But if that, that person is going to bring you poor goods, it will not meet the standards. You, you can't take those goods. Um, you're not getting value for money. So, but that's the principle. So, first of all, value for money. Secondly, they must be transparent and end of it. The, third, the, the second objective is that while the government is doing that, it also wants to empower certain people. Because we are not our children to the youth today, I will start with the youth. The, 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 the central government <coughs> says, they actually be used to empower seven sections of the population, youth, women, and SMEs. Those are the, the three that have been 
that have been singled out. In addition to that, also local suppliers. So in other words, if, if you have to compete, if you have a local supplier manufacturing water competitively, and you have a foreign supplier manufacturing water, you should take, you should promote local supplier. Why? Because that, first of all, that person is creating employment opportunities here. Secondly, that person hopefully is a good citizen, is going to pay tax and therefore will have to be able to, to, um, to have enough money to build buildings like this because it's big tax money. Um, and and, uh, and, and secondly, that person is going to spend money in the local economy. That, that is going to have a multiplier. So that's why um, public procurement acts it. No? You, you must give preferences. You would, of course, because we, we, we want new businesses to thrive. Because, as you told us, the youth institution, so you want them to thrive. Right? Women, because women were previously disadvantaged. So we need to promote each of those women. So, and in the end, that's, that's why the ex was like. You, you, may, you may have noticed that, um, that in, 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 in January this year, we call the Code of Good Practices. Now, the Code of Good Practices basically is applied to the employment of these groups that I talked about. Because before, there was, nothing, there was no guideline as to how do you empower this, this, um, these sections of the society. Now. So the Code now says, you have a, a business of paper. Is there any difference? Okay. Youth, women competing with people who is not in that category. You must give preference to this particular. The price may be different, of course, in that scale. I'll come back again. Issue of, of competitiveness and value for money. Of course, you expect good business to be competitive. But if the price is high, you can, you can tolerate it because you want to promote the youth. Um, the code set a limit. It says the price of a, a youth business will not, will not be more than 10 percent of the loan. So you can still tolerate our price, but it will not be more than 10 percent. Why? Not 10 percent? Because you also want to promote businesses that are, that are sustainable. Um, because if government continues to pay a lot of money for, for things, it means that money instead of of having some savings that we can put in the hospital, that money is now only only going to that particular. So those are those, those are the objectives of the um, of, of that. Um, maybe I should pause there. I don't know whether maybe I can additional witness, but let me pause there. All right. Thank you, Honorable Shimi, for enlightening us on the uh, objectives of the Public Procurement <coughs> Act. Maybe just a follow-up question to that. Uh, as Minister of Finance and Public Enterprises. Uh, what powers do you have in, in, in ensuring the implementation of the Public Procurement Act? Very good question. So, the, the Minister of Finance is responsible to oversee that the Act is implemented, but is not in charge of the procurement of public aid. So, the procurement is decentralized. So, if you are the public entity in this case now, let's talk about the Minister of Health as a public entity. Or for instance, non power as a public entity. If you are non power, the Act allows you to procure up to a certain level. Yeah? So there's a threshold. If you are going to procure these goods, you can procure up to this, up to this level following the guidelines and, and, and the parameters of the, of the law. So the law is our guiding instrument, um, but you can do that in general. Above a certain threshold, that procurement has to be done by the law, by the central procurement board. But then it's here for this acting chairperson and also the acting CEO of the public board. That's what they're responsible for. So, Minister of Finance is not involved in procurement law. We won't be involved in our own procurement as Minister of Finance. When you are buying pens and water and things like that, that's here. Yeah. Do that. Because we, are, we, we then become a public entity. The only then other responsibility that the Minister of Finance has is it, it, it houses what is called a policy unit. 
Porque ela é um polissimilite. Não há ser o outro. Porque ela é um polissimilite. Esta por o advice. Sabe? É difícil. Quando porque ela é um negócio. What standards should we follow? What are the guidelines we should follow? And an example is not following those standards. So they need to give advice. Unfortunately, the act does not give them enough teeth to say, um, you're not following the rules and they're going to give you. And unfortunately, that's not the lady. That's something that we have to think about. But they have, they, they are empowered they to report those who are not following the law. If they suspect that this, for instance, the element of corruption is okay, they can, they can, they can uh, report that particular issue that particular corruption. So that's a good um, So that, that's how the act has, has been structured. So it's utilized that way. Procurement is done by public entity. Mr. Pan is this provided an oversight and not a price. So far, I have answered as an answer to your question. Yes, thank you, Ramoshi. I believe we have a better understanding of the Public Procurement Act. Uh, moving on to Mr. Gabetene on the Central Procurement Board. Uh, I think this is a, a board that, uh, especially of late, everyone has quite a, a lot of interest in understanding what is the mandate of the board and uh, what is the works of the board. Maybe if you can just uh, enlighten us on the mandate of the Central Procurement Board of Namibia. Yeah, um, thank you so much, um, Erika, for sitting. Um, let me also just take the opportunity to take copies of the presence of the elders. Yeah. Um, I got it as a junior nature of uh, the organizer. It doesn't need to go to any academy or college. That's natural. <laughs> <laughs> as Ed probably was, he has, uh, he has written a history of being the first SG to write the two consecutive games. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I also want to take cognizance and uh, just recognize the presence of the minister. Um, and, and also my fellow technocrats, Mr. Ben Agombe, uh, from the Ministry of Health. The, the mandate of the Central Procurement Board is quite very simple. Um, its mandate is to procure on behalf of public entities. Um, for any procurement which is above the public entity threshold. Um, I know that also in terms of the act, um, the money further goes on also even when it comes to issues around um, leasings of state properties, alienations of rights, so on. Um, but obviously the regulations to go to those um, areas um, have not been uh, promulgated. So that still sits to be in the um, So um, that, that basically what we do. Um, and I would really want to and um, instead of being theoretical tonight, probably spend more time to talk the process so that the colleagues can understand the of how we run the whole procurement. Um, there is so much that needs to be done. I remember a month ago receiving a complaint from Peter in Accra region, saying that um, um, another Peter had already started providing the service, but they have not been informed. They have not been informed of this. Just to find out, in fact, the tender was done at the end of the day. It was never made of central procurement board. So, there's this thing where people talk about meetings and tenders, they think that everything sits at central procurement board. But I think the difference comes in it when you look at the issues of the threshold. In terms of the demanding way of the Right, before you take a seat, uh, I just want to have a follow-up question. You mentioned uh, the threshold. Maybe just to uh, uh, enlighten the, the, the audience, what is, this, what is this threshold that we're talking about? At what threshold does it then go to the Central Procurement Board? Um, the, the Act, in fact, has um, um, followed the classifications of public entities in terms of TS. Um, so you have the Public entity that falls in T1, T2, T3. 
um, would have this public university in one category, you would have public entities that are in a um, um, tier two or tier three also sitting in different categories. But overall, um, you don't have any public entity that has powers to procure works. Works now means constructions, which is beyond or above um, 30 million, 35 million. You don't have any public entity that has the mandate to procure goods above 25 million. You don't have public entities that have the mandate to procure non consultancy services above 10 million. So well, those are the three that have been divided into works, goods, and then consultancy services and non consultancy services. And the threshold for all those types of categories of procurement are also different. But obviously, the max that any public entity can go is basically based on. Right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ngavichene. But sometimes the, the public entities might have exemptions. Um, obviously, yes, approved by the Minister of Finance to procure about that. that, that. <coughs> All right, uh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, coming to uh, Mr. Ben uh, Nangombe, uh, it is understood that many hospitals in the public sector uh, report insufficient quantities of essential medicines. Is this because the Ministry of Health and Social First, it could be because when the ministry tries to procure this particular medicine, the medicine is actually not available in the market anyway. Because what is known as the active pharmaceutical ingredient is not available anyway. So you find a situation where a particular medicine, let's say high blood pressure medicine, is not available here, it's not available in South Africa, it's not available in England, it's not available in India, because the active pharmaceutical agent cannot be found. So nobody would have it. That's why. Then you would have a situation where the shortage of a particular medicine in Namibia is a function of the ministry having procured a medicine from a supplier, but that supplier is not delivered on time. So then we will not have that in our health system. It would also be a function of maybe a delay in the health facilities. We may have the medicine here at the Central American stores, but the health facilities have not ordered the medicine to help them in the facilities downstream. But we need to look at the bigger picture. In order to procure a sufficient number, a sufficient amount of pharmaceuticals or different supplies, the best case scenario 
would be where we put in place what is known as the long term contract. So, so that you announce a bid, uh, if it is a large procurement activity, of course, the central procurement board will do that. And you put in place a two or three year contract. That will allow for you to have better contract management. It will allow for you to have predictable prices. You want to buy a Toyota car, you don't go to a factory in Japan and order from there. You buy from who can you store from in Amazon? If you want to buy any item, you would have to go through those locations. But what we have done, uh, given the fact that we need to have to realize savings and get more money, there are mechanisms called food procurement mechanisms. So, for example, when we buy uh, vaccines, we could go through the UN food procurement mechanisms to UNICEF through the WHO program from there. But they don't have all the items. Second challenge that you would have Namibia is a small economy. If you are going to approach a manufacturer in India or in China or in Indonesia, and Namibia wants to buy, let's say, 10 million of a particular item, or maybe 1 million, depending on what's 10 million. And Nigeria, with a population of more than 100 million, and Indonesia, with a population of more than 100 million, go to that same manufacturer and say, I want to place an order of 100 million. And Namibia is going to say, I want to order a budget of 1 million. Might post them to look at. You don't even make the cut in terms of being considered to be supplied by that In 2018, we read an expression of interest, having learned about the approach where countries would hire high-end members and not buy them. You kind of ask the suppliers or the manufacturers to give you the medical equipment and then you pay them a sort of a lease. When we went to the manufacturers, we called Philips, we called Samsung, we called Siemens, we called GE, we called others that manufacture this. That expression, expression of interest uh, gave us two important lessons. One is that the costs were prohibitively higher than what we would have uh, received and we go through, for example, the computer study. Secondly, many were not even interested to just say we want to consider bidding to supply them. So all these factors contribute to whether we have sufficient medical equipment in the country and whether we have sufficient uh, I just want to say one thing. Now following the outcry from this critical supply uh, that uh, we have spoken about here. We did not seek idle. We actually engaged as a ministry, our minister engaged his counterpart from the advisors and public advisors, engaged the central government board with a view to addressing the problem. And the technical teams have actually worked on an approach uh, that is going to help us address the challenges. And it's being done in two levels. Uh, for the most urgently 
need the feeling and supplies, the Ministry of Health and Social Services is going to be allowed to get out certain programming activities for a period to cover the needs of our home. And then the rest will be done by the Central Programming Board uh, for a period of 10 months while we are waiting out the internal modalities in terms of uh, looking at the sources that we can have and looking at uh, the ways in which we can best secure the clinical supplies and but it's a complex matter. Uh, what I want to assure uh, this gathering and the general one is that we are operating on the basis of exactly what is laid out in the public program. And in terms of insurance transparency, in terms of uh, insurance accountability, and in terms of ensuring that the activities that we do go towards the improvement of the health conditions of the people. That is our own, that is our only uh, mission to uh, make sure that the public health facilities have the uh, supplies that they need. And I think I need to also just make mention of one thing, and that is to say, yes, even the question of so when you buy, when you have to buy a physical item, you need to have the qualified human resources to do what is called quantification and processing. And this is done by the professionals in the field to determine the needs of the country and to put a cost to it. So all these things are being done in tandem. And uh, we believe that uh, we have a recipe for success. We are going to make it happen. And uh, uh, the objectives of the act are going to be. Uh, let me rest it there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gangome, for that detailed answer to the low quantities of medical supplies in our public health facilities. Uh, maybe going back to Mr. Ngavetene, uh, in order to ensure that the public health facilities are well stocked uh, with medical supplies, uh, I think Mr. Ngavetene did mention that one is to ensure that uh, uh, procurement is done on time, but then there's also a notion that the tendering process uh, because of the tendering process, the Ministry of Health uh, ends up waiting long periods for suppliers to be approved. And in some instances, the suppliers end up not being able to deliver the goods and services on time. The Public Procurement Act also makes provision for direct procurement. Can you enlighten us, what is direct procurement and in which situations does it apply? Um, thank you so much. Uh, the submission and the question also at the same time. Um, look, the, let, let me let me speak a bit through the issues of um, the whole procurement process. Um, the, the process will basically start with, with the public entity sending us a request to say, get this list, we need to procure this, and based on the cost estimate, we assume that this is above our thresholds. Therefore, we don't have the money in the facilitate the procurement. Therefore, we want the board to obviously um, procure for us. Now, you remember that. Um, uh, that is me has referred to the policy unit. The, the one of the functions of the policy unit is also to standardize the, the tool and the instrument that is being used in government. So that's why you will always hear the word uh, standard fitting. The standardized document would have a standardized document for goods, you have a standardized document for works, you have a standard, standardized document for, for consultancy and, and for non-consultancy services. So there is a whole document that needs um, obviously to 
to be provided to central government or to the public entity in the to public procurement. Then once that bidding document is with us, the next thing that we really do is to get the whole technical provision criteria. Um, because then how do you decide that you are going to give this Mr. A or not, not, not? Um, so you basically run some validations and you do scoring and so on. And then up to when you run to financials um, part of it. But remember that um, you, you have a board which is a consisting of individuals with various expertise. Um, from legal to procurement to um, and, and you would not necessarily find all the expertise in the board because you know, the board basically is the only consists of nine members um, and you would not necessarily mean that you would also have a medical doctor there or you would have pilot or you would have um, an expert in railway in case you have a procurement from Transnami so we, we depend on the expertise and public entities in terms of telling us what they want and what are the specifics. And, and also in, in terms of telling us when we are going to put up and we are going to put up valuation criteria and scoring criteria. It should be framed in such a way that with the valuation committee members can independently be able to um, look at the leaders document and be able to score. So I'm saying that just to give the, the background to the back and forth that is in most cases is there between the board, the public entity of um, polishing up this building document. Then once we agree that we are happy with this building document, we send this building document out to the bidders to be able to understand exactly what what is expected and what we want to bring. They would have a very good understanding in terms of how they are going to be scored uh, in terms of technical evaluations. Uh, um, so then we would then send this document into the market. Now, in terms of the act, if it is not a request for quotation, if it is not emergency procurement, you have to run the bid for 30 days. So I know. Can't run it in, in, in less than 10 days. And then, um, obviously, yes, the people will close and then we will have data submitting, obviously, their, their experience. Given the drive which has been there in the country to try and empower previously disadvantaged people, women, youth, and so on, you will find that the bids for tenders of construction. Supply delivery, cleaning, landscaping, you will receive bids up to 90, up to 100. And you have three PC members who have to evaluate. But be as it may, in order to try to remain independent as a board, what we do is that we place an advert, and this advert is ongoing on, on our website. So we say anytime you can go there and apply to become a member of a big evaluation board. Time you work at Tasman or you work at Nast or you work where, but once you apply, you see your CV and you provide a certificate of product from the police, we then approve you and you become part of the BC members and you are on our database. So for every bit that is coming, we'll say that if this one is clinical supplies, so we we'll need a pharmacist, we we'll need a nurse. Then we'll be someone with procurement, someone with finance. Let's go to the bid to, to our database and see who has those qualifications. And we, we nominate and then we call to see who is available. I'm, I'm mentioning that so that we also have an understanding to say we appoint people who are also on full time employment somewhere else. And for a week, a BC can meet because one of the, of the members is either traveled out or either he's too busy, he has to meet him away, and so on. But we thought when we believe that that's something that we need to try and retain and manage because it gives us independence. Then you cannot say that the board is either for rising to favor certain leaders. In most cases, our PC is never less than three members. 
the m is always the odd number. And it must always be odd number. So if one of the members has an excuse to say he can't make it this way, then that means he can't make it. Do like that. Um, but, and, and I think that's, that's one of the challenges. But if you look at some bits where you, we really have 20 and less, it seriously doesn't give us a map to evaluate the bodies of the In most cases, are bits that attract a huge number. And what is also happening, and I think it's partly just in the nature of human beings, with regard to those bits that attract a huge number, like clinical, clinical we have run about up to almost 99 meters. They have submitted their bits. Um, the pieces would really start well, and then as it, the day goes, then they start taking the next thing is. But I think that it's in area that can be meant. Um, and, and, and obviously then after that, once you have the report, the, the board will look at the report and might, they might have some findings to say that no, I said, we don't agree with your finding here, we don't agree with your ground of disqualification, we have verified this, and then the basic goes back and come back and so on. So that's really protract the whole process. But to make matters worse, then it comes in once we have issued a notice of award, and there is an application for review. And it's something that we cannot avoid. Now that we cannot, something that we cannot avoid. Um, it's, it's, it's provided for in the act, and it's also linked to our constitutional rights not to have remedies if we feel that certain administrative action um, have done us wrong. So, but I also want to respond to the issues around why we always experience, or maybe the ministry always experience, low stock levels. And I think it's time for us as Namibians to have a serious conversation about it. In most cases, it's about suppliers not being able to supply. Why? Because sometimes they don't have the means. But given a precious quarter, you have to pay the suppliers in order for you to supply. You have to go to DPL maybe, maybe you are not treated worthy, and then that whole process stops. But how do we balance that vis-a-vis -vis the questions of empowerment? Because we can also not say, don't give to anyone, just give to entities that are reputable and that are, that are known for, for supply. Find it well. But then how do we address the issues of employment? How do we address the issues of employment creation? And also, and, and, and it's one thing that I have been saying, and, and I'm saying that maybe this is the type of platform that we need to have as young black people. When you are so lucky that you have managed to get a tender and you have supplied with make profit, please let's not spend money on cars. <laughs> We must save that money so that when we get the guest patient sorter, we are able to supply of ten. And I think that's a conversation that we really need to have. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gavantene, uh, for enlightening us on what are some of the delays, uh, some of the things that causes the delays in the in the awarding of the of the tender process. I think maybe just a, just another follow up question to that one. It's just to say that. Uh, I think you mentioned the issue of means or ability to fund a PO. I think, uh, uh, just, just as a side note, uh, isn't capacity one of the criteria that needs to be met when a tender is awarded? Uh, but I'll, I'll leave that as a side note. Maybe you can, you can answer it at my next question. Uh, in terms, in the event where uh, unsuccessful bidders for a tender on uh, pharmaceutical items, uh, for example, wish to ap uh, appeal the decision of the Central Procurement Board, what are the steps uh, of the appeal process and how long does this take? Yeah, let, let me also quickly just talk to the issues of capacity. Um, there, there is a limit to which we can establish capacity. Now, we can, if we want to address that issue, um, then it becomes a barrier to entry. So then we can basically just put in a claim and it says, together with your bidding document, Provide us with the letter of credit, 
that the bank can provide you with 10%. Or either demonstrate to us that you have enough capital in your bank or either in your business to supply this. Then it becomes a barrier to entry, such a way that then you will never have new entrance into it. That's why we always try to say this. Just go and get a letter of intent, but letter of intent is just a letter of intent. And the banks have also realized that they can make a lot of money for them. So they can charge you 400 dollars or 500 Just to issue a letter that just it intent. It doesn't necessarily mean that once you get the award, I will give you the facility. We, we always try to make these posts evaluation requirement so that then we only put pressure on those who are intended to be awarded with the, the hassles of going out there and seek funding. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a serious challenge. Um, and, and I think it's partly linked to also our behaviors um, in the sense that sometimes we get these kind of facilities from the type of SMEs and then in between we go and direct the flow of funds goes into our personal account by the time SMB is trying to raise its money, it's only seeing cars and some photos in nice beaches and so on. So, and, and I think that that's basically what we, we really need to look at. Um, what, what was the second part of the question? Uh, it's in, the, in the terms impact of on the process. Yes. Um, once the board has reviewed the report from the BC and the agreement, the BC recommendation, will issue what we call a notice of selection of an award. Now, the notice of selection of an award, it's a communication of intent that the board gets to award you this contract. If in a period of seven days, there's no objection. That's what we call the stencil period. Now, obviously with the new amendment, we have reintroduced um, the three considerations. So what we do is that if you are not happy once you have given the consent with the notice, realize if you have not been awarded, or either you have been awarded a, a, a wrong um, court, um, and so on, you can write back to the board. Says I'm not happy with your decision on the basis of ABC. So the board will take that and, and we will reconsider our decision. We in agreement with your, your grounds, then you would obviously um, change our decision. And, and if we say that no, our area decision stands, then we can then apply to the review panel. Now I have seen people engaging lawyers applying to the review panel. And the very same reasons why the review panel has been introduced back on cost of litigation and to make the process easier. And then all people always think that once now it's the review panel, then they need maybe with some legalistic language and whatever. I say whatever you are thinking that why not, why you have been done wrong, just write that on the letter and give it to the review panel. So within seven days, the seven days have passed, you have written to us, we are, we, are, we are telling you to say that no, we stand by our decision, then you can just write to the review panel. Then the, obviously the review panel will then consider your letter. Right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if any of the panelists want to have anything to add before we go to allow the audience to ask a few questions. Mr. Nakope. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, there was a question on, on direct procurement and, and when that 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 happens. Um, Basically, the law made provision for direct procurement. Uh, in the most instances, direct procurement would, for example, go to public entities that provide the services. For example, if you are in Bengal and you need water and electricity, you procure directly from the government or from the public entity. Or if you are uh, in Kotibarongo, you procure from the same entity. But there are also instances where, for example, um, there is a particular manufacturer of a local or a local manufacturer of a particular item uh, that the public entity will require that you can then also approach that entity or you can seek 
project is talking about to make sure that we have short term and short term for pharmaceuticals, chemicals in the short term, in the long term. It's, it, it, it's something that we, you know, we are working together and, and, we, and, and we want to strengthen that whole process. To ensure that long term, we are not going to have those um, in, in fact, as a matter of fact, well, tomorrow we are going to get a different movies and myself from the technical team. The last time we got to the last two ago. As to how we do it, in making sure that short term supply, the medium term supply, and the long term supply that means that the is responsible for because it's also part of that team. That um, so, okay. so we'll get that to the moment. So hopefully, going forward with the continuation of fine tuning. This legal instrument that we have, a fascinating our institutions, we will be able to overcome this problem and, 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 and hopefully show that it will become something of the past. But it's a process. Just one more addition there, that is essential to that. Um, the importation of pharmaceuticals is totally controlled. And the, that means that the, you only buy medicines that are either registered in the media with the Namibia Medicine Control Council or that are imported in terms of section 37 of the which it makes provision for uh, what is called compassion clearance. Now, the challenge is in many instances when we fly a bid, the, the bidders would provide for medicines that are non-generic, but we know that generic medicines are actually also effective. So, uh, but they have been challenges with respect to us getting the necessary provided credit from council in order to import the particular medicines. But we are addressing that. And we are addressing that by way of, you have what is known as the stringent regulatory authorities that the NMRC in Namibia aligns with. So, for example, we will be aligning with a stringent authority from South Africa, from Zimbabwe, uh, from Australia, from the United States, from Canada, for example, or from Europe, in general, and the EU. Uh, but that would then mean that we are not harnessing the capacity of other manufacturers, uh, let's say, in the African region. A country like Egypt, for example, they have become known for producing very good quality medicine. Other countries in the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia or Iraq, they have become good manufacturers. So we want also to expand the market from which we can order or we can procure like Egypt, Ghana, Kenya, and others. So we have set in motion uh, at the ministry level to engage also. Uh, so that uh, those that are supplying medicines to Namibia are also able to source from these other markets. And I think, as the minister, you can recall, this is part of the uh, sourcing mechanism that we are looking into the new uh, intervention of the government. I just want to thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, indeed, uh, our panelists have set the tone uh, and they have unpacked this topic for us. Uh, but also judging from the audience in this uh, auditorium today, uh, in, indeed this topic does have quite a uh, whole interest in it. And I'm sure we are all eager to also enter the discussion and also have many questions to ask. So at this juncture, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Yalo to then facilitate uh, the session of uh, the Q&A. Good. Just like um, Comrade Pindi has said, this is now the time that we um, will give you, the audience, an opportunity to ask all your burning questions. <laughs> I see the hands are already going up. Um, so just a few, oh wow, okay. <laughs> so um, we'll do a thing where we'll ask three questions, we'll allow three questions to be asked. Um, yeah, and please make sure they're brief and to the point, and then um, we'll allow for the answers, and then we'll do another three questions, if that's okay. And um, you're welcome to, the mic, the mic that's going on. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so, yes, we'll just give you the mic and then you can introduce yourself if you like to, otherwise, you can just um, ask your question. Yeah. 
All right, um, let's give an opportunity to have those three questions answered. Um, and then we'll um, just prepare your next three questions, please. And let's just remember to please, one question per person, and then just be respectful, please, when we ask our questions. Um, and then let's please be brief and to the point. So, um, I'm not sure who wants to answer which question first, um, but maybe, is there someone specific? Okay, come in. All right, Jimmy. Yes. Since the youth may be very excited about the youth, but the US study that one. Youth and women culture. Yeah. Very good. I, I, I fully agree with you. In fact, um, when I was talking about the code of the world, the code is actually essential addressing what you are. So when the procurement act was put into the it makes provision for regulation to be issued. The code is like a regulation to be issued to um, give life to this provision of empowering these specific categories I've talked about, youth, women, and uh, local, local producers. Now, unfortunately, it took a bit of time. So we started working on the, on the code um, in 2021. Um, it was very important they had to be Consultation, I mean, uh, basic consultation, which uh, all of you, I hope, some of you participated because it was widely advertised. So now, if you have an interest in the procurement, you must also participate in things like that. So the code was written in, um, in February this year, 28th of January, if I'm not mistaken, this year. Now, what, what does the code say? The code says, you are going to give preference, as a public entity, you are going to give preference to this category of feeders for, for specific things like water, uh, you have mentioned um, below a certain question, exactly what you said. So, when you, when, when, when government is looking for water, public entity, Minister of Finance is looking for water, and you have Mr. Kapitanet Pino, who is, you say, Mr. Millionaire. Mr. Kapitanet Pino is not youth, um, and he is competing against two youth companies. Yeah? So Mr. Kapitanet is not going to be considered. Because the preference, the coach said the preference must be given to the youth. Now the competition will be between, because those will be your own, the other youth companies. The competition will be between the youth companies. The same applies to women. So they will have they, the public entity will have to think. The youth, yes. Um, you see, local supplier, yes. Then, what is his price? No, his price is reasonable, it's not more than 10% off the lowest price. Therefore, this is the person, or this is a company, or anything that must get the agenda. So, what you said is, is, is basically addressing that goal. And I want the youth to, to educate themselves about this goal. But because it's for you. So, I think it's already there. So, um, I don't think we have to, we have to do anything else. Um, yeah, and the way we I think there was a gentleman who was talking about the local manufacturing. Uh, maybe the EU will come in there. But I, I just want to say something. I, I believe we used to have a cost effective before. Yeah? So what, whatever we, what, whatever we, whatever institution or, or entity that we think we, 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 we want to establish a local entity, it must be able to survive. It must be able to, to produce products competitive. In other words, if you are going to produce content, you must be able to produce content competitive. Because otherwise, the government is going to waste money on you. So if I'm going to buy a content from you for $100 at the government, and I can actually procure that, that condom at $2 elsewhere outside, the nation and the society is going to, to save and put that money in education. That 80 something dollars in education or health if I don't go beyond it. So, yes, we need to empower local entities, but they must be cooperative. So, if you don't be cooperative, it's going to die. It's not a sustainable.
Um, but, but yes, I, I know that the really what happens around the medical supply um, was an unfortunate incident. There were a number of factors. Um, but I think I think it's the risk that you take when you are professional the, 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 the sacrifice that you take for your family. Um, what I always tell people when they are asking me, and I remember during that week, you find you and family members and the, the associates sending you some metal there saying and so on. I say, but what's the issue? <laughs> But can I understand the culture where we are as a country? And when things like that, that, are, that are only are important, then everyone concludes that no, maybe, maybe they had the cut and now they are being investigated and whatever. But seriously, what happened was, other than the issues of the errors, for the 30 million um, in terms of quantity versus the we were quite genuinely thinking that we were applying the provisions of the X when we conferred in advantage on someone who was going to be a When, and I remember very well that day when I was sitting in the courtroom asking one of the BC members who works for Ministry of Health to say, but this person is more expensive than others, why are we wanting it? Oh, that person is affected. Now, that response coming from someone at the Ministry of Health, I was thinking they are already buying from there on small procurement. And that is someone who has been part of the thesis, who is part of the institution for, for whom we are procuring, and then, other than that, why would, why would I need to have a doubt about it? So, what I really try to say is, in fact, there was no underhand activities and under the table, round hand of and so on. I think we have just made mistakes based on honest and authentic judgment or a displaced judgment. So that's why for me, uh, I, I really don't um, have any duty watchers because for me it, it still remains professional. But I know that the perception out there is different. But that's the sacrifice I think that I can do for my country. In all of us, we are, we are able to make these things procurement function now. Everyone understands. Yeah, everyone. I think that's basically what I would really want to say. Now. Let me just one more thing because this, uh, I'm concerned we need to be practical in terms of how we discuss these matters uh, at the beginning of our engagement. Uh, so, for example, we spoke about barriers to entry. How do you bring in new entrants into the government program, the public program? For example, one of the barriers that the new entrants may face is a requirement in a deep document that would say, uh, you must give us a letter stating that you have done this way before or you have delivered the same item before. Uh, we are talking about the simple items made of stationery, etc. So what we have done in the ministry is to say up to a certain amount, if these items are not necessarily life and death items, you do not need to give us that item. We are going to consider our deal without that letter. Because in the past, if you don't have that data, you are thrown out immediately, even before your kid is open. So we want to, we have done away with that for certain items, just to allow those that want to enter the market to do so, pick up the experiences and maybe deal with themselves. So it's just one of the practical things that we have been doing. I also just wanted to say, um, you will always hear people um, saying that the board doesn't do due diligence and so on. And, and, and it, it's becoming a problem because people even faint things that you think people should never even think about making. <laughs> um, 
How do you know a financial statement, three years financial statement, that the person that has submitted is fake? Now, what we are being forced to do is that we need to look at who has signed off your financials. And in order for us to do that, then it means now we must go and take the name of either the accountant or the CA who have done who have signed off your financials or either in your financials and then we must consult all the professional bodies on accounting services to see whether that person is registered. I, I'm just highlighting that and if you are dealing with 90 builders and then you have to do that, the impact on the timeline on the procurement process. Even people faking things like company document registrations. Do we really need to go for each company and go and talk to people to verify whether these registrations are fake or safe? So I, I also think as a public, we are also starting to create and throwing in spinners into the process of procurement and, and, and obviously creating the whole process. We don't have a system where all the entities speak to each other and where you have a um, kind of a standard format of documents. Um, for example, you take social security, you just use a paper with the details, you don't have a space. Or anything. You look at, yes, number and I have started, but anyone can take it. How do I have to authenticate that? So there, there are also those things that, and, and, and I think, is human factors. What one can get is human factors that are obviously now making the whole procurement process also kind of better. But uh, I think we, all of us, we have a duty to ensure that in the end, and, and I think that's a pain that some of us are sitting with everything. And you sit there, run the whole process up to the end, when you are about to award, you are being told that no, but Comrade Nekoko was part of the VC related to Comrade EG, but he never disclosed. So that whole process is ended. Six months, gone down the drain. And then I don't have the meds. And you don't have the meds. And then I'm always sitting without the meds. Um, so, so there is quite a number of factors that is really affecting the public procurement, and I think we need each one of us to make a contribution towards that process. Three years, you should just say, have you prayed to say, okay, after the three years, the company should select, let's say, an SME and train them for a year or some country, why we should not trust them. Thank you for the recognition. I am very to Shelby. The question I want to ask, I hope it is not in consideration, but it's directed to all the panelists. The Procurement Act of Nigeria makes provision for every Namibian not just to equally participate, but a chance to participate. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, yes. Sorry for that. Um, what measures are in place, be it from the relevant stakeholders, the central government for the ministry, and also the, the Ministry of Finance? What measures are in place to ensure that it's not the same leader that is being awarded this status? Because we have seen, I'm going to make reference to the condo tender, we have seen the same company being awarded. Tenders by the same ministry. So how does how does the relevant stakeholders ensure that it's not the same people that have been awarded the same? Thank you so much. Yep, thank you. One more one. My question is basically based around the issues with public uh, website. Is that it? This side, 
And it's also why I I was trying to understand how the evaluation is that there are the names of the that process when that members don't have to show up and that are able. Maybe the suggestion is they should have the lab accounts so that they actually carry on working with diligence so that they are able to go through all of the applications. That's why I feel like the bureaucracy is too much. Maybe we need to put down the bat so that all these applications go through cost uh, and then
that this particular data already has maybe up to two different contracts. But obviously, he is also participating in the next one. And it turns out that he is the, the lowest response is um, um, substantive beta. And, and if that happens, you, you don't have the basis in law not to award him. You just have to. Um, but and we have been also wondering to say, maybe can we come up with regulations? But the question is, when will you say you have enough? to basically what? If I have one project which is originally left with four months, then I have another one which I just started at halfway and I'm finishing at the end of this year, will you deny me a contract that is starting next year? So you have all those kind of technicalities that makes it very difficult to, to regulate. It's not that we, we are quite trying to that consent. The issues of BC, yes, the BCs get sitting allowance. In fact, all along, they were just getting one payment. Um, whether you expend two months or three months, the whole evaluation process. Now, to try and also encourage them, what we have done is to say, we'll pay you for the first phase of evaluations where we have done the evaluations and you present the report to the board and then the board issue a notice of selection of award. Um, we pay the full amount. If so happens that that procurement is challenged, it's actually no better and it's referred back for evaluations. We pay you 50% of the initial fees. That is very, we, we really try to, to encourage people then to come back and do finalize the, the, the evaluation. So that, that is, in fact, I think the, the, the allowance is quite uh, a benefit and very change of market. And uh, what we want to encourage the police who have the necessary skills to apply and be part of the database. And anyone who managed to be part of the BC and, and get to one evaluation, then they become converted. Then they say, that, No, I don't think that you guys are corrupt. <laughs> Yeah, there was a question on the website, and I think the e procurement portal. Uh, the, the procurement policy unit has encouraged public entities to advertise their procurement activities on the e procurement portal so that this information is centralized. So, what has been happening is that um, if you go to the website of the Ministry of Health Social Services, for example, uh, it will redirect you with a link, like a hyperlink to the e procurement portal where you can find the information for all public entities that are engaged in procurement. Uh, I think that is uh, it's a new development. Uh, not many are aware of it, but that is uh, what I'm the reason behind the e procurement because we, we want to automate the procurement system. Hopefully, one day we have a procurement system which is less manual. So, the, 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 the idea behind the e procurement is that this, this is the first step. So, it's, we have, we now have a platform where, first of all, public entities will have to place. Yeah, procurement plans. In other words, announce in advance that this year these are the kind of things you are going to buy. So that most of the bidders can already start to prepare themselves. They can also then put the procurement documents there. Um, and also you know, information about how how the the, the award has, has been or who who, who got the award. So all that basic information is important to them. Unfortunately, not, not many um, public bodies are, are putting all, the, all these necessary documents there. The policy unit is working very, very hard to sensitize them, to encourage them. The number is, is becoming more and more and more, but we, we still not, don't have everybody there. Um, the, the, unfortunately, we don't have any other power that we will not go to the law to say that we, if you don't. You don't I place all your all the documents on the on the procurement portal 
they will be sending something that we have to be dealing with. So that, that is not even that. Maybe that's something we have to, we have to think about to ensure the good days of lives. Um, after that, we are directly busy looking at a new system that is going to um, take us to the next step of automating the procurement system. A bit complex. We are now looking at the user requirements. Hopefully, in a couple of years, we will have the whole process also be completed. And I uh, also hope that all the public entities will, will be able to apply. And yes, we need to take out the information. Thank you. Thank you for these answers. Um, so we are running out of time and um, we do need to ask our final three questions. So please make it meaningful and keep it short and to the point. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry? Oh. Not here. Before you speak, sir, can we? Um, so we see that there are many questions that um, have been brought forward, and um, we are running out of time, and obviously we can't answer all these questions here. So um, we would like to create a platform where we can submit um, further questions, and then we will then pass them on to the panelists, and we'll have them answered in due course. But we will still continue with our you, the second second person, and then one more question after you. I just wanted to ask the Minister of Finance, 
you speak of value for money. What is the standard for value for money? Was speech of state of different physical question. If I was close to Jesus. He <laughs> <laughs> says, anyone belongs to Caesar to Caesar and to God to God. But my question is it's a simple thing that you find a special person that was a person that was the sign with us the ministry of health produce condoms locally. And the minute, I think he says, no, the, the, one, the manufacturer must be able to be competitive in the other markets. Because in my own entire life, it never existed. The young person, I have never seen a country or a, a country that has never, a, a government that has never forced its young producers in supply and production of things. But my question is, now, if you are saying for value for money, do we sacrifice value for money for the livelihoods of people who are being generated for the day, for the daily lives? Do we sacrifice it? To whom do we sacrifice our money to be it is the value for money? For instance, if smile was in existence now, with the additional value of production of oil that we have discovered, we could have been producing quality like the exponents. In two other in two processes. Please okay. get to the point. To the point, please brief. We are running out of time. Brief. I'm very passionate. <laughs> 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 I'm not for I'm not for, for, for production. But if this young man is into production of condoms, it must be the government. They have not allowed, it must be amended to support them even for the next thousand of years. It must be deliberate. If young people are into production and innovation in the beginning, government will say, this guy is producing condoms for electricity or bricks. Let the, let the tender go to say, okay, as we are going in here, young people, let's develop for the next 50 years, let's bend the money. Money gets stolen, money gets one, but let's bend money in innovation. Now we say, no, standard of investment.
because they are so good. How is the fairness in terms of ensuring that when tenders are given, are given the right people? And do we also test the workers with the use to ensure that we are also pulling them into active measures? Because there was no one who pressure for me to be a minister of something. And we have to have the determination. So what role does the procurement board play in terms of bringing those that have the commitment but that they did not yet realize the potential in terms of also being potential leaders in the field? Thank you. Thank you very much for those three questions. We'll now give the panelists an opportunity to answer the questions. And um, in answering the questions, I would also like to um, ask you to please give your final remarks so we can conclude. Please remember that you can submit any other questions to us. You can write them on a piece of paper now or submit them to us via SMS or electronically. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I just, um, the one question that uh, was addressed to me relates to the barriers to entry. Um, it's exactly that realization that we found that there was a barrier when you are requiring leaders, even for smaller items, uh, for them to give you proof of prior work. Because if you do that, no new entrant will ever come in. So that's why we did away with that, with that requirement. But it has to be implemented. Because the downside of it is, or the other side of the coin is, if you do away with that requirement, and then you award a bid to a person with no experience, no infrastructure, nothing, no, mar no markets, no suppliers, you will then see the same problem that this person is unable to deliver, and because they are unable to deliver, you will not get the items, and then the public starts to complain. So we have to be methodical about it. We have to start with implemented steps to see how it works and then move on and on and on. If you just do it and say, do away with this requirement, you end up awarding bids to entities that cannot survive. And if you award bids to entities that cannot survive, the ministry is not going to have, let's say, a toilet or a cleaning material or whatever. And then the public goes to the hospital, they say the hospitals are filthy, why is the ministry not cleaning? But it's actually because the bid was awarded to an entity that did not supply the material at the time. You see the contradiction. So we have to manage these things properly. And we have started with really that by saying up to a particular threshold, the bidders will not be required to provide this proof. And we must be careful and we must be careful. So uh, I just want to say that this is a Yes, just to, just no, to no, 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 because you cannot put the lives of human beings at risk uh, to give a award to somebody who does not have the appropriate license. You can't do that. The risk is too big. Very good. I, I, I think it's, um, it, it's important for us to understand who does the, the, the law want they found. When we talk about local manufacturer, local supplier. So the law is not intending to, to empower just any Namibian who is going to supply this. The law is intending to empower a person who is going to manufacture manage, manage, manage goods here because the law wants to create employment. So if you just have a briefcase company, you are going to, to buy things from China and sell to the of violence, that's not what the, what, what the law is aiming at. So, and then for a local supplier is, is, is defined as somebody who has got an entity, he manufactures, he or she manufactures things here in Namibia, creating employment, paying taxes, um, paying utilities. So that's that's how, like somebody asked me, how, how, how do you get the money moving? That's how you get the money moving. So it's not a free case now for somebody. But let, let's get it right. Then the second thing is that they, they put together. Now, again, food procurement is aimed at 
When government is procuring things that are not being managed, they are also procured outside the limit. Yeah? Because those things are not available, they are not, they are not being manufactured here. They, will, they are manufactured elsewhere. You go outside. Now, the logic is saying, instead of me and Namibia going to Rome, let me find other governments or other entities that are also going to procure the same goods. So that when I talk to a, man, a, a manufacturer outside, I have a bigger bargaining power and therefore benefit from bigger discounts and, and, and I'm going to save a lot of money. So it's not somebody who is. Uh, it's, 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 it's not it, it things that are not available in Namibia. In other words, not money to get in Namibia. So I, I, I hope we get it right. Yeah? Um, and, and therefore, it's meant for that. And it's really meant to help government to get discounts so that we can save on the cost of procuring pharmaceuticals and other products. The gentleman who, um, who is very biblical, <laughs> I, I, I think I have. Uh, I have probably answered your question as well, but waiting for money really means when well, government is acquiring goods and services, must get this, the right quality at the reasonable price. Now, you perfectly have said we need to empower um, local businesses, but you, you need to empower them if they are able to give government value. So, if for instance, I'm, I'm going to give you an example again, because there are costs. You are, I, I can see you are shaking your head, but you need to understand, you need to understand the context. If I'm going to procure this bottle here, in Namibia, one thing in Namibia, yeah, at 1,000, one bottle, at 1,000 Namibian dollars, while I can actually buy that, and this company is, 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 probably, is, is probably employing three people. Yeah, and I'm going to, and I have a choice to procure this outside, where I can procure it for $5, it doesn't make any sense for me to buy it from an Indian company which has me $1,000. Whether you talk about the environment, because that, that's money that is built elsewhere. This is the money that you need to build roads. This is the money, if you are going to spend on one person, then you are being irresponsible. Yeah, then you are being responsible. You are no longer a responsible government because you are actually wasting Namibia public money. So that's a concept that we need to understand. So we, we uh, no, me, no, 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 it's not a dialogue. Let, let, uh, let, 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 let me finish. Government, people. If you have to look at what I'm saying, please, please, can we not have a dialogue? Please, no, no. Government, people. We are young people, we are learning, we are learning as we grow. The government must be deliberate in that. Okay, Commander Bravo, thank you. Please, thank you. Very good, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Let's not have a dialogue. Hmm. I, I talked about the, the government has introduced an instrument that is going to empower the youth. And it's giving preference, it's giving preference to the youth. And then this instrument, he says, youth, you can be expensive, but we can only go up to 10% difference. Yeah? That's enough, in my view, we can differ on that. In my view, that's a responsible way of empowering the youth. You are empowering the youth, but you are also making sure that the money is spent responsibly. I rest my case. Um, I, my, my final words. Once again, I'm very touched because I see many of you have an interest in programming methods and an interest in ensuring that Namibia has a good procurement system. So I, I'm, I'm very hopeful about the future of this country because. I see the youth, many of you have an interest in this, something we can very touch. And uh, thanks for, for inviting me to be part of this, this important conversation.
markup of $1 and you can sell it to government for $11, but you decide to sell it for <laughs> And that's where it should start. That's where it should start. The one thing that we need to understand, we need to understand the strict government just as women think. In as much as the way as individuals, the way we have limited in terms of our resources, government also has limited in terms of its resources. And government can only generate more if it's really spending what it's supposed to spend for. Otherwise, if all of us continue to inflate our prices, for nice to inflate prices, we are ripping off ourselves. And maybe some of us are unfortunate, we might be for another 100 years, when we end up with problems and also our future generations. This, this thing called government is ours. And we have to protect it at all costs. Imagine that you make business from government and you still cheat government, you don't pay tax. How do you expect government to procure from you again next year? So I think in, in element of honesty and ethics, we we'll really make sure that we use money for our own people. Um, I think there was another question around how do we make sure it really that the process is fair? Colleagues, well, if anything is said about central procurement board and the public is more likely to believe the energy, I don't believe that. Because it seems like as a country we have been off the, off the scarf in terms of morals and ethics. To be honest. But as we are sitting there, what we really sit there and try and do is to do the right thing. But we've also realized that when you have uh, VCs from outside, people who don't have any relationship with the institutions, who will only be there for a day and go on, who don't care about the reputation of the institutions, yet they also do things that compromise the work. And, and we are sitting with that question in terms of how do we move forward in terms of anything that is. It's, it's, it's painful when we sit with the process of programming for six months while we need to deliver that service to the public. But unfortunately, when you are guided by law and regulations, we just can't get the process. Sometimes I sit there and I say, I wish it was a private government. They just wake up on Monday and they just say, finish with this election and give this order these people to supply, and that's it. But unfortunately, you can't do that because then you will be held to the law and also to the regime. But our real, genuine, honest approach is to try and be to everyone. But yes, we are dealing with human beings. All right, thank you very much to our very uh, able uh, panelists uh, for undertaking this uh, topic for us. Uh, yes, there's a lot of emotions and passion and interest in this topic, but uh, just in conclusion, I would just like to say that yes, uh, we have come to the end of our, of our panel discussion. We have, we have unpacked the objectives of the Public Procurement Act. And we have also heard of the of the code of, of good governance uh, or good practice. Pardon me. We have been enlightened on the mandate and operations of the Central Procurement Board. I'm sure all of us are, have more knowledge on what are the operations, what is this mandate. And then also we have also looked at the issues that are affecting the insu uh, in insufficient qualities uh, quantities of essential medical supplies in our public health facilities. Uh, we have also shared our views. We have asked our questions. Uh, and also, I think a very interesting point is that anyone can apply to become a member of the BIT Evaluation Committee at the Central Procurement Board. So it is a call on us as young people to also use our skills and expertise to be able to, be able to also save our country. So let us register on that database and also so that we can be part of that database. And then finally, let this discussion not end here. This is just the beginning. 
We have a lot of questions, some of them were answered, some of them were not asked. But let's share our questions. No, 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 we are not, we are not ending uh, SG. Um, we're just ending this session. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, sorry, before I, before I hand over the mic to the MCs, Yes, let this conversation not end here. This is just the beginning. Let us take this conversation back to our, our districts, our, our sections, our branches, in our classrooms, in our workplaces. And then also as young people, let us also bring our ideas. There was a call here. If you have a question, you have a suggestion, bring it to the leadership so that we as young people can also formulate our ideas and our position papers that we can then also send to our leadership to be able to see that our ideas are also implemented. So thank you very much. That was not a fair round of applause, please. Another one to our panelists. If you just joined us and you came late, welcome to the Swapo Party Youth League Commerce Region Health Seminar. And it was hot. <laughs> Please give yourself another round of applause. Comrade <laughs> Finn, I believe justice was done today. Yes, justice has been done and the stone has also been set. The panelists is soon and they are dressed. <laughs> Please, I think they deserve another round of applause. Huh? Because <laughs> the, seat, the seat was hot. Um, yes, the young people have spoken and our distinguished panelists have listened, so I believe. Before I continue, I would like to observe the presence of Comrade Emma Theophilus, the District Info of Samora Michelle, as well as the presence of Comrade Emma Tangi Muteka, the District Secretary of Windu West. Yes, with that said, With that said, fellow comrades, allow me to grace this podium with one of my favorite quotes from a political philosopher. Franz Fanon once said, and I quote, every generation must discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it in relative opacity. Thank you so much. I will then call uh, upon the SG if she has any final remarks to make before I call on the last speaker that will then give the vote of thanks. Inquired 
some information, taking them to the fore when they want to do procurement on goods and services. How to do it? How honestly and how prudent the application should be. I think it also has taught us that we must not cheat our government. But, but the youth are also saying, yes, we understand you, Honorable SD and the Honorable Minister said, but those Nigerians and Chinese and and uh, 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 Hong Kong, they have also started somewhere. Yes. Yes. yes, they even provide goods and services where value for money. But when are we going to start so that we be enabled also? For money, one day, two days. So this is what we are saying. Yes, there is a need for us to prioritize which and what are the skills and knowledges we need to enable us to carry the economic thing of our government. Mm -hmm. This is what we are saying. And therefore, I, I made a pledge when I was there, when I was just telling to them, when you want to call me again, please do not hesitate with the people that are knowledgeable in the sector so that we engage first in the house, and we establish ourselves, and we also detect where the loopholes are, either in the ex that we have already passed, and how we can fix it to respond to. <laughs>
Viva comrade Amon Gebetene, viva! Viva! Viva comrade Serenismus, viva! Viva! Ao gol de lista. <laughs> comrade Feni, viva! <laughs> Thank you very much, Comrade SG, the Iron Lady. The tone has been set, but we need to go home. So I'll give it to our, our Comrade to make us happy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the, lion, I, the Iron Lady has spoken. It is said if you wish to move mountains tomorrow, you must start by lifting stones today. With that said, allow me to call upon the youngest member of the National Council. The youngest member of the National Council, as well as the District Secretary of Windhoek West, Comrade Emma Tangi Muteka. Yeah, no, uh, colleagues, unlike the moderators and the MCs, I'm vertically challenged. So I hope you can all see me and hear me. Good evening, comrades. Our young people. Good evening, comrades. That's much better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director of Proceedings. Comrade SG, our ever young uh, SG of the Soccer Party. Comrade Ipumbushimi. My boss at the FRI. Um, NECC members, both of SPYL and that of the mother body present here. Bushe, hi girl. <laughs> Sorry, that's what we usually do. Sorry. Um, the chairperson of the Central Procurement Board, um, Comrade Amon Gavitene, as well as Dr. Ben Nangobe. I really want to say something. Doc, you're tough, huh? <laughs> You see, when was it last week? Was it last week? Last week, Dr. Ben Nangombe and I were in Sokopmund. And he experienced the heat of all heats. So when I walked in here and I said then, I said, oh, I need tea. Doc, so you're a doctor of, of heat, huh? <laughs> I don't envy you, Doc, I really don't. But uh, you did an excellent job. Thank you very much for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been given the responsibility to give the vote of thanks, um, which is probably the um, easiest thing to do. I'd like to first and foremost thank the ECOMED CC as the sponsor of the entire event, as well as I was told to apparently refer to him as yours truly, but I'll refer to him as ours truly, Comrade William Angola, the Commerce Region Treasurer, as the sponsor of this event, and to thank each and everyone who's been present here today. You've sacrificed your time. It is Thursday, we're preparing for Ama weekend, <laughs> but we're all here. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, if I may have not um, perhaps recognized your presence, my sincere apologies, and also my sincere apologies for being late. Um, we had a very serious crisis at the office, um, but I'm glad to be here. Last but not least, I really don't want to keep us long here. Comrade SG, would you agree with me if I say that today there was one picture that was painted? And that is that the youth is ready. We are ready. Yes? Other than that, comrades, thank you very much. I'm wishing you a pleasant evening and let's please get home safely. Viva Swapu Party, viva! Viva! Viva the Woman Council, viva! Viva! Viva the Elders Council, viva! Viva! Roar the Young Lions, roar! Roar, roar the Young Lions, roar! Roar, roar the Young Lions, roar! Roar! Thank you very much, Thank you very much. Uh, normally when closing remarks are made, all you have to do is ask the people to stand up so that you can make the closing steps. Thank you very much. So may we 
all stand and sing the party anthem.